Um, just for your info, we're recording from now on. And we will go live in one minute and 50 seconds. Let's hope he's coming back on time. Uh, I will be in the background, but I'm going to switch off my camera now. Same for me. I hope there's someone to jump in if necessary for Martin. Um, there he is. If necessary, I will jump in. Um, but I still hope that Martin can reconnect. I hope as well. Um, I'm going to give um maybe you can pass it to martin the presenter's chat i'm gonna give an him yes ah, there yes okay. martin ah wonderful so, so leave it on okay. three th yes i'm not that i will not touch anything anymore <laughs> uh, but we have three out of we have three out of four now yes th there is no video of alexei there is no my video i see the alexei screen but not the video neither the the mic I see Alexei. Uh, I don't see the video of Alexei. Yes, the, yeah, the, picture frozen, Alexei. the picture is frozen for Alexei for me. Okay, it's black. Oh, I see black, not even frozen. Alexei, can you speak? Uh, I, I can, and I, I can seconds. hear all of you. So, Alexei, so this is... We have okay, I left. propose Just... we stay like that. As long as you can speak, it's still okay. Yeah, and please... If you have problems, turn off your camera. Uh, so you you cannot see me, none of you. I, I can, can you at least hear? Frozen, frozen picture. So it's your live there. now. Oof. Thank you. Can can we see how many people are following? Oh. Yes, you can on that these. Some 30 so far. Okay. I understand uh, that we are now live and uh, that the session is also recorded. So I propose, Martin, you start. Okay. Good morning. Good morning uh, to our audience. Uh, no, let's wait uh, for three more minutes. Let's wait three more minutes uh, for more people to, to join the session. We start at 9.33. Good morning. Good morning. We just said we wait until three minutes after 9.30 before we start.
Okay, well then let's start. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. Thanks to everybody who is here um, to, to follow this session of our research and, and innovation days uh, this year. Um, it's an all virtual conference this year. Um, it's all in the spirit of transitioning towards uh, Horizon Europe, which will be our new framework program for research and innovation uh, here in the European Union. My name is Martin Übelhaar. I'm a, I'm a head of sector in uh, DG Connect in a unit for cybersecurity technologies and capacity building. I deal with our funding programs uh, amongst other things. I am glad to be joined today by three distinguished speakers. We have first Fabio Martinelli. We, we will then have Alexei Kirichenko. And last but not least, uh, Stephanie Vena. I will introduce them more properly later on um, in the session. I also have my colleague Monika Lanzenberger uh, in the call who has supported the uh, preparation of, of this event. Let me draw your attention to the Q&A function of this platform. Um, let me remind you that in the audience, you cannot use your microphone or camera. Please use the chat function. We have had technical issues um, on this platform, but uh, we really hope um, to have a smooth uh, running today. Why care about cybersecurity? And why care about cybersecurity in the context of uh, research and innovation? This summer, unfortunately, we had the first loss of life of a person directly attributable to, to a cybersecurity incident. A university network in Germany was attacked by a known cybercrime group. The attack was extended to a hospital which is affiliated with this university. The hospital was partly incapacitated and a, an ambulance carrying a person in a critical state had to be diverted to another hospital further away. Unfortunately, this person passed away on, on the way to that uh, second hospital. This is just to give you one sad example of of the many costs to our societies that, that are created today by malevolent activities in our growing digital uh, world. So this is why we have been active on the side of the European Commission uh, to further cybersecurity and, and digital privacy for a long time. Let me briefly outline some of the challenges that we see today. Let me also then give you a glimpse of our policy portfolio of how we uh, think to address these challenges before then benefiting from the insights of our distinguished speakers about how research can contribute to these challenges. We witness today an issue of capacity building in cybersecurity. Um, we see the weakness of entities, many of them small and medium-sized enterprises, many of them public administrations, let alone private citizens who also fall victim to, to, to cybercrime. Um, but it, they don't have to be that small organizations, as you heard from that sad uh, example about the university and, and the hospital in Germany. Um, we see the challenge of what we call operational cooperation. This mostly, mostly relates to information sharing between the professionals dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, countering cybersecurity threats and, and incidents. Um, so we, we think we can do more and can do better to share information and to, and to join forces to counter uh, incidents. Um, we have what, uh, what, what we call a growing attack surface. 
So all of the, all the IT buzzwords in the last years, you know, they have contributed to that. So we're in transitioning towards 5G, the next generation of mobile network uh, uh, mobile networks. We have the Internet of Things, so more and more devices and machines becoming connected to the Internet. And we have more and more artificial intelligence in our digital systems. All this provides new opportunities for people uh, with malevolent intent, unfortunately. We have what we call supply chain issues and supply chain insecurity. I mentioned 5G already. So um, we rely on complex digital products and systems, um, which are composed of components which are sourced from many in, in many different ways and from many different parts of the world. And this in itself creates complexity and uncertainty, and, and it can also create straight up uh, security issues. Cybercrime, I mentioned. Um, skills, I mentioned, both at a very low level where we're talking more about awareness and at a very high level um, talking about cybersecurity professionals where there's also a, 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 a lack of, of, of supply on the labor market. Um, there's also somewhat of a supply demand articulation problem, we think, whereby the, you know, those people in Europe who really know about the latest cybersecurity technology not always get to talk to all the people and all the organizations who face cybersecurity challenges and who need to, who need to step up their defenses. And last but not least, and here again, we're more center stage to, to, to about research and innovation. We have an issue of commercializing the excellent research that we have in Europe today in cybersecurity. So um, other parts of the world are better at creating agile, dynamic, growing companies and suppliers of cybersecurity knowledge, um, whereas we still suffer from what has been called for a long time uh, the valley of death between research and the real development, deployment, commercialization of of knowledge and know-how. In terms of our policy portfolio, how to address all these challenges, I will not uh, go through all of it, just to mention a few. There is the NIS directive, so the Network and Information Security Directive, that's the, let's say, shorthand, it's not the official title. And we're reviewing this directive by the end of the year. And it applies in particular to operators of critical infrastructures and also to, to the public sector and authorities and member states. We will also come forward at the same time with a new cybersecurity strategy. We have set up a framework for the cybersecurity certification of products and services in Europe at the European level. We have worked with member states and we are, are working with member state authorities and with mobile network operators to address the issue of, of 5G security. The commission made a recommendation there. We have come up together with a toolbox and we will be following how authorities and operators will implement this toolbox. There are various networks of professionals and there are various recommendations in the area of operational uh, cooperation. And we're currently looking into the concept of a joint cyber unit to basically more uh, give this a more permanent, more organizational, more, more institutional uh, framework, this op operational cooperation. Our agency, ENISA, is very active in, in uh, raising cybersecurity awareness and supporting the skills development. And last but not least, and that's a bit my own daily bread, is, um, is our proposal for the European Competence Center and Competence Network for Cybersecurity, where we seek to bundle the management and the, prior, the prioritization uh, of 
cybersecurity research and innovation and deployment in the new digital europe program in a in a an, an institutional structure and we will do that together with member states and and with industry and academia providing all the input with that let me stop here i hope to have set a bit the framework the the scope and the tone for our discussion this morning again i have asked three distinguished speakers to think about what they think are cybersecurity challenges today and what research and innovation in horizon europe can and should contribute to to, to addressing them i would now like to introduce our first speaker fabio martinelli Fabio is a research director at the Italian National Research Council. He is uh, very active in all things security and privacy, in particular in distributed and mobile systems. Among other things, he has been advising the Commission in the Horizon 2020 Protection and Security Advisory Group. And he acted as first director in the board of the European Cybersecurity Organization, EXO. And so in, also in that capacity, he has helped moderate, you know, the, the great input that we receive from EXO uh, when we in the commission, we draft the work programs, which we then discuss with the member states. Um, Fabio, the floor is yours. Please, uh, I'm looking forward to, to your ideas. Thank you very much, Martin, for the invitation and the opportunity to speak uh, at this event with the fellow researchers. Uh, I think you already introduced uh, very well uh, what uh, cybersecurity is. I mean, with the digital transformation, uh, cyber is, is everywhere. It is in our healthcare system, you mentioned, it's our transport system, it's in the smart working, you see COVID, what we are doing, and so on and so forth. So it's really a crucial element that influences our lives and uh, we need uh, to cope with this what i usually say is that the protection of the cyber is actually is the protection of the everything and so this is uh, exactly goes in the direction you you were mentioning as uh, both of national research council researcher and as you mentioned uh, I, I have the opportunity and the pleasure and the honor to to to, to moderate uh, working group six of, of exo that is more than 400 experts ranging from research and academia to to industry and to government uh, trying to link the the demand and the and the supply side of the research innovation there are many challenges that that we need uh, to to tackle and to face uh, let me say that the first that is also my my favorite one is uh, security engineering uh, okay i think we need to always try to build more secure systems i say as i say more secure rather than secure because you know it's extremely difficult to build a, a totally secure system we need to reduce vulnerabilities that are there we need to build the systems that are more uh, resilient and uh, in particular, I think exactly to address uh, the need of the both of the policies, but the real actual need is really the, to build the systems that you can prove that are secure, and then you can prove that are secure to other people. And also is the assurance part that is even more challenging and difficult. And this uh, definitely there are a lot of technologies and methods that we need to foster in this direction, and the community is working in this, and definitely will be useful uh, to support uh, the, the the Cybersecurity Act uh, with the certification aspect. So security engineering is one thing, uh, build the system more secure. And definitely this means also putting together security requirements, engineering, privacy, security and trust, but also safety. So security and safety co-design. And this is crucial. I mean, now we are seeing this in the automotive sector, uh, where there will be soon or there are already autonomous driving systems that are influencing our lives. And so the interconnection between between, let's say, cybersecurity and safety is even more evident from what you from what you said. And 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 a remind when we engineer something, it is close. What we do is more closer to to military engineering rather than civil one. I mean, we are, our discipline is different from from others. Like when you uh, observe uh, the nature, the nature uh, is not actually changing depending on what you do usually. Instead, in our framework, we build a system, we make it secure, and there is someone human sometimes rational or sometimes not, I would say, that attacks the system. So when we protect a system, we put a countermeasure, actually the countermeasure is attacked and so on. 
it is it would be more like a game if uh, unfortunately as you said this has this uh, has a terrible consequences often so we really need to to consider this when we develop our system so i would say prevention is better than the cure so the first thing at least i mean both uh, for myself but also clearly for for exo working groups is security engineering assurance and, and and i would say eventually certification then the other big thing that i can imagine and and, and is actually shared by by, by a little view you also mentioned is data huh? data is the new oil uh, we need to protect data uh, when data is a personal identifiable information so privacy you need to empower the citizen to protect his own data when data is cyber threat information you need to protect data when you share between different parties so that is control data sharing are technologies that we need to to empower i mean those are uh, as we recently mentioned as the core of the gaia x uh, uh, initiative french german initiative on 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 on, on on the secure cloud and so we need to foster this sort of data protection approaches in several directions data however it's not just data with artificial intelligence data are used to create new algorithms to make decisions eh? and so clearly the protection of the data the credibility of the data the trust that you can have on the data is something that will be reflected in the consequent algorithm that you build on top of this and so you need uh, and i think alexei will will likely speak more about this we need uh, to avoid data pollution data corruption you need to to have uh, trust uh, and reputation methods for for computational methods i would say uh, for data sources and so on and so forth so the protection of the data is crucial for for everything also related to fake news disinformation and so the political level that is another big dimension did not mention the beginning but i mean uh, why cyber is so relevant i remember in 2016 the scientific advice mechanism of the european commission started to think uh, to, to 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 the initial research topics and the first one was pollution of lightweight vehicles the second is cyber security because cyber security can can subvert governments is really a a, a a crucial a crucial area of research and, and at the basis of this there is the protection of the data i would say after data there is artificial intelligence how can you use the technologies to protect the system for instance for monitoring the system checking for anomalies at the same time exactly for what i said before we need to protect the artificial intelligence mechanisms from corrupted data adversarial machine learning and, and this kind of uh, of element that for sure are there uh, artificial intelligence can also be used for instance to to protect the software and we currently in my group we are developing systems uh, that allow to find bugs uh, more easily through artificial intelligence so to reduce the vulnerabilities in the software so it's not just an area for itself but it's an area that can help uh, all the other aspects um, Again, when we speak about data, I'm pretty sure that everybody of us uh, can think about crypto. Uh, as been mentioned by, by Martin, we have uh, in, in Europe a long lasting tradition of excellence in this area. Uh, and uh, we need to continue to foster this, uh, to, to, to give prompt, because at the basis of uh, all the, let's say, chains of technology that we build, there is the, definitely a protection of the data. In, in this area, there are several directions. Uh, one thing that uh, that is clear is post-quantum cryptography that are basically mathematical algorithms able to resist uh, to new quantum computers when they arrive. I'm not saying if, I mean, uh, but I'm saying when they arrive in order to avoid that uh, the existing communication are uh, tampered, especially for asymmetric cryptography and, 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 and the like. The other big area in the cryptographic part uh, is uh, for sure secure multi-party computation. So how we compute together uh, the results uh, in such a way that we do not share uh, the input and we just uh, perform uh, uh, computation in a secure manner, both uh, through fully homomorphic encryption, I would say, so working on encrypted data, and this is crucial for virtualized environment, edge, fog, and cloud, uh, and, and, and so on. This is the last five, 10 years, I mean, the, the, the theoretical results are more than 30 years, but in the last five, 10 years, we have uh, started uh, to have uh, really technologies, even open source, that allow to, to perform this kind of things. So and then hardware security is for sure is another uh, big area. You mentioned IoT. Uh, IoT security is explicitly identified by EXO, but by my many communities. I'm also working in, in, in the Sparta Competence Network, and there also IoT is a crucial element together with, uh, with for instance, situation awareness and, and, and security engineering. So the things that I'm somehow depicting uh, are definitely identified there. I mean, there are billions of objects there. 
So you need to protect them because these objects allow you to monitor infrastructure, railways, uh, roads, uh, cards. At the same time, when you have billions of devices there, maybe weak because uh, uh, the, 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 the computation resources are, are low, and then we could be attacked, and you can use those to attack other systems. So it is the protection of the IoT is dual, and it's very relevant for this reason because uh, you can arm the system at the same time uh, you can attack other systems. Uh, imagine that your fridge starts to attack uh, someone else in, in Canada. This happened already, and, and it's not very interesting. And, and these are basically many of the things that, uh, that I can, uh, can tell. For sure, we have also inside uh, EXO many other areas, but I'm trying to identify like distributed ledgers and, and, and cryptocurrencies. This is definitely an area that is related to trust, uh, how you build trust uh, in, in a distributed manner with these new technologies. It is, it is a big area. And then there are all the vertical sectors. A, a thing that we need to consider is the digital transformation. Before I start to do information security, then we do cyber security because, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, cyber is, uh, is everywhere and we need to, to protect it completely. I mean, I, we have uh, soon we are issuing EXO with SRIA version 2.0. So this will be open for, for consultation to everybody. And I think you can find there uh, several insights and happy always to, to chat and discuss about these things. Thank you very much, Fabio. This is this was really excellent. This was a quite a large overview of the many of the many technical challenges, uh, which we uh, should start um, which we should continue addressing also in our work programs. Um, I would now like to hand the floor to Alexei Kirichenko. He is um, a security engineer at F-Secure, which is one of the, uh, probably the biggest pure player cybersecurity uh, company in Europe. Before I properly introduce Alexei, Alexei, can you, can you say something to see if we can hear you? Because we cannot see you, that's for sure. Uh, you cannot see me. Can you hear Alexei, me? Say something. I'm saying you, you cannot hear me. Oh. In that case, um, Alexei, yes. one more time. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? No. In that case, I would uh, really like to apologize for the for the little uh, glitch. Um, uh, you can hear excellent. Who needs a, who needs a moderator? Oh. Alexei, you speak. I, uh, Alexei, <laughs> introduce yourself. You speak. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, this is really unfortunate that the connection is, is semi broken. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks very much for for the introduction. In any case, uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, and of course, thanks very much for for the invitation to this session. Uh, as Martin mentioned, I work at F-Secure. Uh, that's a provider of cybersecurity products and services headquartered in, in Helsinki. And uh, I'm actually responsible primarily uh, for our European research collaboration activities. Uh, as Fabio mentioned, uh, I will discuss uh, a, a little uh, on the connections between machine learning and cybersecurity. Um, and uh, also discuss uh, topics of, of how these things could be articulated in the Horizon Europe project, in the future Horizon Europe project. Uh, but I want to start with a bit different topic, uh, which is cyber insurances, which uh, I consider more as a way to improve security than just the business, uh, and also a way to bridge together multiple domains and technologies in cybersecurity. Uh, cyber insurances, uh, they connect to many and many security domains and, and technologies uh, and so, sort of a viewpoint at various security challenges and, and developments. Uh, it was almost 20 years back in, in 2001 uh, when I read a brief article by Bruce Schneier. Uh, the, the article was titled Insurance and the Computer Industry. And uh, he viewed uh, cyber insurances uh, as a security governance mechanism. Uh, insurers uh, would 
assess organizational security posture of their customers. They prescribe security procedures and controls. They provide post-incident services. And they, <clears throat> they ask right questions from their customers. They ask whether their customers have managed security monitoring services, whether they have high quality firewalls, whether they have security patches in place. Uh, and uh, if they do, then uh, their rate from the cyber insurance point of view becomes lower. And uh, this is how good security would be rewarded in the marketplace. Uh, and at that time, uh, my, my naive feeling was, yeah, this is how it should and will work. And now, almost 20 years down the road, uh, we have another paper by Daniel Woods and Tyler Moore, uh, which is titled, uh, Does Insurance Have a Future in Governing Cybersecurity? Uh, citing the paper, uh, they, they, they say cyber insurance appears to be a weak form of governance at present. Uh, insurers writing cyber insurance focus more on organizational procedures than technical controls. They rarely include basic security procedures and contracts, and their discounts offer only a marginal incentive to invest in security. So, uh, given all that, and given that cyber insurances are not very successful in the global market either, uh, it, it feels like uh, cyber insurances did not live up to the original promise, uh, at least not yet. And uh, there are, of course, both business and technical reasons for this. Uh, and I think addressing some of the challenges uh, would be a good goal for Horizon Europe projects, uh, because uh, the benefits of addressing those challenges uh, in many cases extend beyond cyber insurances. So uh, j just to very briefly mention a few, uh, for cyber insurances, uh, we need security assurance methods, uh, and, and those methods need to be nearly continuous uh, and also affordable from the cost point of view. Uh, those are important for cyber insurances, but those are also important for, for example, validating compliance to standards, and, and also important for security certifications, as mentioned by both Martin and Fabio. Uh, one of the key challenges for cyber insurances is uh, whether and how cybersecurity vendors uh, can demonstrate that their products actually reduce losses from cyber attacks, and then by how much. Uh, and again, uh, this is important for cyber insurances, but also for any organization that needs to select products and services. Uh, excuse me. Just... <laughs> okay. Sorry, I was checking emails from, from the colleagues. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Another thing that I wanted to mention uh, in connection with cyber insurances, uh, we, we need to, to be able to assess risks. And for that, we need historical data, we need methods and models, uh, and, and those, for example, for losses brought by cyber attacks. Uh, again, uh, th th this has a high role in cyber insurances. Uh, this also has a high role in, in general risk management. So, so uh, the, the point was uh, that cyber insurances uh, and, and viewing things from the cyber insurance standpoint uh, contributes to many other domains uh, in, in cybersecurity. So uh, moving to my next topic, uh, I, I would like to discuss briefly uh, the use of machine learning for security monitoring, uh, dynamic de attack detection and response. Uh, I think the use of machine learning in, in dynamic attack detection and response today uh, uh, probably uh, has more PR role for companies, uh, more than the actual practical value. Uh, and there are several well-known challenges. Uh, uh, data availability, especially availability of label data um, uh, from dynamic attack detection, in many cases, it's not even easy to define what data, uh, what, what label data would mean. Uh, most interesting attacks, uh, those attacks which are most difficult to detect, uh, they are rare. It's very difficult to get data of such attacks. We do use simulated attack data. Uh, that's better than nothing, but that's not always adequate. Uh, and, and then we have those cases when our models perform very well in test environments, but perform rather poorly in actual operational environments. Uh, there are clear challenges of how we handle concept drift uh, and then changes in the monitored environments. 
those changes, they affect the underlying probability distributions of various events. Uh, and, and that leads to missed attacks to higher number of false alerts. Uh, this is a clear research challenge at the moment. Uh, we need to be able to handle the detection context, and, and we need to do that in resource-efficient ways uh, and over longer periods of time for detecting slow attacks. And slow attacks we often find in the advanced attack category. Uh, we want to detect attacks earlier, but we want to do that with high confidence. Uh, and uh, achieving both at the same time is clearly very challenging. Uh, as Fabio mentioned, uh, machine learning models can be attacked, can be evaded, poisoned, uh, and that, of course, is a serious challenge of using them in cybersecurity. We have to protect those ML models themselves. Uh, and when we use, for example, machine learning for response, uh, a difficult question is how to predict consequences of various response operations, response actions. Of course, the value of machine learning in cybersecurity can be increased, uh, but I think many in the domain agree uh, that machine learning can only be a part of the logic, and it has to be combined with um, traditional AI, symbolic reasoning, and involvement of the security operators. Uh, and of course, there are many ways to combine uh, machine learning and then symbolic reasoning and intervention of human operators. Uh, at the moment, uh, most of the practical methods of combining those ingredients, they are very simple, but maybe there are better approaches to how we combine uh, uh, those approaches together and, and how we get better security. Uh, I think one of the high goals conceptually uh, is uh, uh, moving from recognizing uh, attack tools and traces like indicators of compromise to learning and understanding adversarial behavior uh, at a conceptual level. Um, uh, I, I, I presume you still can hear me? we can hear you it's okay monica wonderful you. okay thank, thank you very much monica uh so uh very briefly the last topic that i wanted to touch uh, uh and this is about protecting ml models uh so, so the the previous topic was more about how we utilize machine learning for security this is sort of inverse how we uh bring more security to machine learning models uh this is important for models used in in cybersecurity itself, uh, but also in many, many other domains. Uh, there are multiple attacks against machine learning, which are possible and, and being studied today, uh, model evasion, poisoning, model inversion and stealing, and those are threats in many domains. Uh, but as of today, uh, attack data of, of real-world attacks is extremely difficult to get, so, so you, you can find almost nothing. Most of the attacks we know of, they are by security researchers, but about real world attacks, we, we know very little. Uh, and uh, there are very high variations in those attacks, uh, depending on how machine learning models are exposed, what can be accessed by the attacker, what can be analyzed, uh, whether this is just um, interface or, or models themselves, or training data used to, to learn the models. Um, so, so there is quite a bit of variation in the attack surface depending on that. And uh, there is still a big question how practical those attacks can be and what could be consequences, which is usually very important for convincing organizations and people that those attacks are real issue that needs to be addressed. And uh, from the defense approaches point of view, uh, there are really multiple options. Uh, we, we, we need to check the uh, code implementation of, of the models and, and machine learning based systems. Uh, we need to have security at model training time. Uh, we, we need, for example, to train on so-called adversarial examples. Uh, we can monitor machine learning models during runtime. Uh, we can check input sent to the models, uh, see how models change uh, in the online learning scenarios, and so on, so on. I think how we protect machine learning uh, has to be a high topic for Horizon Europe in the years to come. Uh, with that, thanks very much. I, I stop here. Thank you very much, Alexei. 
and I have kept uh, Martin uh, informed about your presentation via another uh, technology. And I think uh, Martin will take over now again. Thank you very much, Alexei. Uh, I will try. Thank you very much, Alexei. I got uh, I got a small summary. Thank you very much, Monica. This is. Um, I, I mean, I hope we're managing well, despite the little technical glitches. What's more, I mean, what's important is, is that the audience can, can, can hear the, the, the speakers. I'm a bit disappointed. I wanted to mention that Alexei is uh, involved in training the Finnish national team for the International Mathematical Olympiad. I, I still want to mention that, I think. Europe needs more athletes. But now, thank you very much, Alexei. And by the way, we will, uh, after Stefanie's intervention, we will then um, go to the Q&A. Um, and, and we hope to still uh, address some of the questions and, and some of the inputs, which I hope will come from the audience. Without further ado, Stefanie Vena. Uh, Stefanie Wiener is a professor at Deft University of Technology. She is a, a leading figure, I think it's fair to say, in, in everything that is research on, on quantum, the quantum internet and network computing. She's involved in the QTech quantum network. She, um, she is one of the founders of the QCrypt conference in quantum cryptography. And she's the coordinator of the Quantum Internet Alliance. Before being a professor at Delft University, uh, she was um, leading a group at the National University of Singapore. And before that, she was a postdoc scholar at the California Institute of Technology. And I'm also excited to say, in, a former li in her former life, she worked as a professional hacker in industry. Stephanie, you bring a, a particular, a very exciting, a very new um, perspective into this um, universe of cybersecurity challenges and, and solutions. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Martin, for this uh, introduction. Uh, it's great to see you all this morning, despite this year, unfortunately, only online. Um, so let me focus on two, just two challenge areas, because, of course, there's much to say. First, technology, and then the much more difficult challenge of actually building a European ecosystem that can ensure both the development and application of such technology actually maxim maximally benefits European citizens. So let me start with technology. So I would like to make the case to you that research and innovation towards a future quantum internet can uniquely contribute to securing Europe. It also offers a real potential, I think, for Europe to assume a world-leading position in quantum internet technology. On the one hand, quantum technologies pose a threat to security. Because once a large quantum computer is constructed, and I'm afraid to say that currently the largest quantum computers also reside outside of the EU, such a machine can be used to break the security of many cryptographic algorithms used today. This is a problem that is already relevant right now for highly sensitive communication. Someone can record such communication today and use the quantum computer in the future to read it in some years from now. We thus need to make sure that we can secure sensitive communication even against an attacker who may have a large-scale quantum computer available now or in the future. Communicating quantum bits over a quantum internet can be very powerful. Amongst many other things, it would allow us to protect sensitive communication as well as access to critical infrastructures in a way that is provably secure against someone who has a quantum computer of the future. Here, security does not rely on mathematical assumptions, but follows from the laws of physics when the implementation is correct. The same level of security is probably impossible to attain without quantum technologies. In particular, post-quantum cryptographic schemes proposed are classical and rely on mathematical assumptions whose validity has yet to be established. 
I would like to emphasize, though, that in my view, quantum secure communications and post-quantum cryptography are complementary technologies that address very different use cases. And we actually know many examples where they naturally go hand in hand. I would like to emphasize also that there are many other potential applications of a quantum internet, which are already known. So quantum secure communication is just one example. So maybe you're asking, given that this sounds all somewhat futuristic, where is this technology right now? At short distances, roughly 100 kilometers in deployed fiber, one can already perform quantum secure communication using commercially available equipment running a single application. Here there's some catching up to do inside the EU27, uh, which would be pertinent to do, since at present all commercial grade equipment is made outside. I think it will take two to three years for commercial equipment made in the EU27 to become available. At QTEC, we have a relatively short-term effort that goes a bit beyond short-term distance point-to-point -point, um, with extra security features, which would also allow many users to use quantum secure communication in the metropolitan area in a few years from now. At long distances, things are much more challenging. And there, two approaches exist. One is tailored to do quantum communication from space, where China is a leading entity with a proof of principle demonstration of quantum communication from a satellite over 1,000 kilometers. This is presently still too slow to allow practical secure communication, but of course it's an amazing achievement. The other is tailored to do quantum communication on the ground. This is challenging since it asks for storing quantum bits in a quantum memory. So far, the world record physical distance bridge is still slightly over a kilometer by us in Delft. However, once such technology uh, matures, large-scale quantum networks using regular telecom fibers, which are already in the ground, would become a reality. Here, things are so far looking good for us in the EU, since we occupy a world-leading position in advanced quantum communication on the ground. To give you some rough estimates for time frame, also I should understood that this, of course, not only depends on the technologies, but also on the efforts invested to drive them forward. I would say roughly three to five years to bridge metropolitan areas, five to eight years to connect neighboring metropolitan centers, and eight to ten years to have the first end-to-end -end proof of principle links really covering European distances. Innovation is key in this domain, since success requires a vast ecosystem that mere quantum, where mere quantum devices really only play a very minor part, enabling the entirety of the value chain. So let me now reflect a little bit on the possibility much more difficult aspect. How can we ensure such research and innovation and subsequently real world application actually benefits Europe and is possibly done, actually done by European entities? Of course, in the security domain, this is of interest in order to trust the devices which are being used, that they're also made in the EU. But it would, in my view, also be highly desirable, uh, for example, our present leadership position in advanced quantum networking would indeed to lead to an exploitation, also commercial leadership and job creation in Europe. And here I see four important activities. The first one is, of course, to continue to foster excellence in Europe across the board. The ERC has, I think, played a crucial role in this domain in Europe for quantum technologies. And I think it's, in my view, essential to continue this in Horizon Europe. The second is to create early deployment. And despite this uh, being about Horizon Europe, there's a close connection to Digital Europe, where there's an activity called EuroQCI, whose goal is to enable the quantum secure communication across Europe. And this has a great potential to provide quantum security to intergovernmental communication and prepare the creation of a European quantum internet. Thirdly, I think it's essential to create innovation hubs to foster innovation using open access early stage quantum networks. Open access here meaning that they can be used by European companies not only to test quantum hardware, but also to provide a development platform also for the software and service industry. For example, connecting also to what Fabio and Alexia are doing, so this can actually be brought in a meaningful way to the end user. Finally, I think it's important to create competitive research and engineering centers in Horizon Europe. We are presently world leading in advanced quantum networking on the ground, but I think this leadership is under constant threat. Especially China has invested billions of euros in advancing quantum communication technology. Similarly, the US, uh, has recent, which aims to construct the quantum internet, has recently established DOE and NSF science and engineering centers. 
And I think we cannot, cannot hope to compete with this using only small-scale projects. And I think this is why it's crucial that in Horizon Europe, we have a powerful framework partnership agreement towards the creation of European quantum internet that integrates research and engineering to finally bridge this gap to eventually bring this technology uh, out in the world to a user. Yeah, thank you very much. Great, Stephanie, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for this. Um, for this very very interesting input um, about this very promising um, slightly futuristic um, slightly exotic maybe uh, for some uh, you know old old hacks in the security uh, domain um, potential maybe we can in the discussion go a bit about um, uh, discuss a bit further about the the, the um, practicalities of, of integrating this. Um, but I would now like to um, invite the audience to submit their questions in the chat or in the Q&A. I see, I see one, uh, one Q&A from Yvonne Herrera. Thank you for your question. It concerns the uh, European Competence Center on Cybersecurity and Network, let me add. Um, a brief update on the status and, and a recommendation how to join the initiative. Thank you for your interest. This is currently, you know, hotly debated, let's say, in, in, in the institutions here in Brussels. So there are um, legislative negotiations ongoing between the member states and the council and the European Parliament, those are our two, our, our two legislators. And the European Commission is, is also closely involved, having made the proposal in the first place, and then later on, you know, being the entity to, 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 to put this initiative into practice. Um, um, I think it looks good. There are still some, there's still some political, you know, kind of issues to, to solve, but I think it looks very good to have the center, uh, I mean, to have the mandate to start building this center and building this network um, early next year. And I can tell you that we are already preparing the work programs, not so much for Horizon Europe, but actually in particular for, for, for digital Europe, so which will be more in, in the area of deployment, capacity building. To actually, you know, support this new, let's say, this new setup um, created in this regulation. How can you um, join this initiative? I think right now that is still the, the legislation is still pending. Unfortunately, there's not so much you can do. Um, I would, however, invite you to interact with two groups of, 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 of stakeholders. One group is, uh, are the four pilot projects. I'm sure you have heard of those. So Concordia, Sparta, Fabio is here. Um, Concordia, Sparta, ECHO, and CyberSec for Europe. Those are four very large H2020 projects which we launched uh, a year and a half ago, uh, <coughs> which will trial and experiment with this um, competence network uh, concept. So, of course, you may or may not be able to join the consortium, you know, the running projects, but they're all open to, to associates and they're all very active in community building. And I'm, uh, maybe Fabio later on can say a bit more ab about uh, the, the community building aspects. And secondly, of course, there's EXO, the European Cybersecurity Organization. Um, we will not formally, it doesn't look likely that we will have another public-private partnership like we had in H2020, but we still very much appreciate, you know, the collaborative structures which have been created in EXO. And, and there's, there, there's a lot of very good work going on in the different working groups. So I would really um, encourage you, Yvonne, to, to reach out to those stakeholders. Um, Fabio, maybe you want to say something very briefly with a kind of community building 
perspective. It doesn't have to be, you know, centered on Sparta or no, no, I mean, Exo. No, I mean, it's clear that we need to build the community, all the four pilot networks as a core constituency, but also looking for associate friends, observers, all of them have this kind of program uh, guided by the commission. So I would suggest that you look at this website and, and join the one of the four programs. And then we are working with the commission, with the JRC to build a, an overall European community. That is actually what Stephanie, what, 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 what the commission say, we need to build a, the European community bridging the demand and, and the supply side of research, and, and we are there. Thanks, uh, Martin, for the opportunity to speak about this, uh, about the four pilots. And next, thank you, Fabio. Um, Stephanie, Alexei, do you would you like to come in on this topic? Of course, not knowing what Alexei is saying. Well, I, I think Fabio. Fabio covered the okay. work, so. Otherwise, I would go to a second question in the Q and A from Jeanette Klonk. Guten Morgen, Jeanette. I I heard I heard you were also on a panel the day before yesterday. Um, hints as regards the budget for cybersecurity and the Competence Center. It's a bit early to say, in particular concerning Horizon Europe. Um, you you will know that in July the, the the heads of state of the member states they agreed on a multi-annual budget for the EU, so we have an indication for both programs, but of course you know there are many divisions and subdivisions within the programs, and um, and that's 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 why that's one reason why it's difficult to say for now in for Horizon Europe. The other difficulty is that this is still ongoing discussions between the European Council and the Parliament. So, um, I mean, let's um, you know respect the prerogative of of the of our democratic representatives to 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 define the budgets. And then, once we have the the clarity, also we in the Commission, we will uh, try to give an indication or suggestion how to split this. But for Horizon Europe, um, both in terms of substance, in terms of the way we do things, um, you can expect a lot of continuity. Uh, I don't think we will reinvent the wheel or we will do something, you know, kind of extremely, you know, differently in Horizon. It's in digital Europe that we will that we will really experiment and, and kind of break new ground. On the budget for Horizon, it's also, it's, it's as I say, it's hard to say, it could be slightly less than than in the current uh, framework, but uh, please bear with us on this. Uh, Christoph, a question for Alexei regarding cybersecurity insurance. How much of a challenge to its implementation is the issue of quantifying harm following cyber attacks? How should this be approached? It's a very pertinent question. I would love to hear the answer. <laughs> Alexei, please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, can someone confirm that they, they can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Here's Monica from the no? commission. I can hear you. <laughs> very well. Okay, very well. So, try, trying to answer this question. I, I thought I partially addressed it in, in, in my very brief talk. Uh, this, this is, of course, very important, and this is, of course, a challenge. Uh, uh, that's probably what is missing at the moment. Uh, for many insurers, uh, this is a difficult problem, how to quantify this uh, loss, this harm. Uh, and for that, uh, essentially, historical data and proper models are needed. And one of the big challenges at the moment uh, is that many players, they are unwilling to share the data. They believe this is their competitive advantage. So uh, that, that's clearly one issue to try to address uh, in, in the coming years, uh, because without that, it's, of course, very difficult to quantify the risks and quantify the losses. That's a very good point. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I think we will probably run out of time. And Martin uh, knows that. Uh, we have a couple of questions still. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank, thank you, Alexia. I think so. The, the, the session will be closed, I think, at 10.30 sharp. So um, now or never, please, to the audience. Um, Cardelen, uh, coming back on the budget. 
it's not a done deal yet. Huh? So, uh, you know, if you are among the many people who think that, you know, uh, cybersecurity, you know, uh, should continue to, to be prioritized and should rather, you know, grow than, um, than stagnate, make yourself heard. Make yourself heard. I, as I said, you know, the ball is now in the court of uh, national governments and, and the European Parliament. Um, but apart from that, I mean, trust us, trust us that, that we will continue to, to support the topic uh, with the different tools available. Uh, Dita Dorlaza, uh, activities are open to the world. Will you handle international cooperation, cybersec? Uh, let's say this research topic is not the one that's most open to the world. That's probably fair to say. Um, on the other hand, we will have a, a framework provided by Horizon Europe and by the um, association agreements, which will be established. Uh, with uh, third countries, and I very much hope that again there will be continuity, that we continue to work with our neighborhood, um, and then we will look topic by topic, you know, and and issue by issue, you know, if there's there should be something where we should do something very targeted, uh, whatever kind of a joint call with one of our kind of like-minded countries or so, um, but that's all in the future, but uh, we'll have the um, we will have the possibility. Jeanette, quantum communication addressed within DEP. Short answer is yes. Uh, how much and to what extent and how exactly is still open for discussion. Um, you should certainly see this um, coming when it reaches the member states. <laughs> Thank you, Giro. I will not come back on the budget again. Uh, I'm really afraid that I think will 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 uh, I'd love to continue um I hope to see some of you uh on the next uh, you know occasion um let me for now thanks thank very much our three distinguished panelists Alexei I'll have to just call you and and find out you know exactly you know uh, because I I want to tap into your knowledge um we see each other and you're you're a kind of very appreciated uh, collaborator but I don't know yet everything that you say always, so um, I'll have to reach out to you again. Fabio, as always, thank you so much. Looking forward, to, looking forward to hearing you on another occasion next week. And Stephanie, for me, it was the first time. Um, very appreciated. I think I've learned a lot today about, uh, about quantum. And I'm looking forward to bringing the two communities closer together. I think it's, uh, I think it's promising uh, and, and, and timely. And I thank very much uh, all the colleagues in the audience. I think we had around 80, 80 people following. Thank you so much for your interest. Keep participating, keep providing input, keep feeding us here in Brussels with, uh, with um, all the challenges and ideas and, and proposals. Goodbye, have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.